Air shocks really suit trail bikes. They're completely adjustable to any rider body weight, they're completely adjustable to any riding style, and they're nice and light. But coil shocks have been on the rise again. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna answer the questions you have about coil shocks on your trail bike and see if and why you should be fitting one to yours. I love air shocks on bikes and I particularly love this air shock on this bike. It feels great, nice and poppy and it copes with everything. Until I rode it at the first two rounds of EWS in Italy. And to be fair, the bike was probably out of its depth just a touch. I was riding with Rich from GMBN and he had a 170 mil bike. This is 150 with a basic shock on here. Now it was all right, but it was just getting a little choked mid stroke to end of stroke. So it's just struggling a bit. And it made me sort of look around at other riders' bikes. And on Team Canyon, they normally ride the Strive for Enduro. That's a big travel bike. But one of their racers, Dimitri Tordo, was running one of these, and he had a coil shock on his. And watching this bike stick to the floor just really made me think, hold on, maybe I could get a little bit more out of a short travel bike like this. Now, before we dive into seeing if you should be looking at doing the same, let's have a look at the differences between air shocks and coil shocks, starting with the air shock, seeing as that is what you would look to be replacing. So basic air shock here. On the outside, you have your main body, also known as the air can. Uh, you have the main shaft. This could be compared to the stanchion tube on your suspension fork. At either end, you have the eyelets. This is where the hardware is mounted to mount it to the bike itself. And then at the top of the shock, you have both the air valve there for putting your air pressure in to uh, pressurize it to your body weight. And you have your damping adjustment. Now this does vary across shocks, but pretty much you'll have a blue adjustment for compression and a red adjustment for rebound. Now, when you look at the inside of this shock, this is where things change around a bit. So I've got a cutaway, it's a different brand, but it's essentially the same thing. So if you look up close on here, you'll see it's essentially the same thing again, but on the inside. So you have another shaft connected to a piston. On one side, you'll have the air, on the other side, you'll have oil. That piston pushes through the oil, and you'll see there's a series of shims here with different ports in. So that is to adjust the damping. Again, you will do that with the dial and the switch lever on here. At the bottom, you have what's called an IFP. This is an internal floating piston. Now, this essentially has uh, nitrogen gas behind it, a very small amount charged through that port. Highly specialist, it's not something done at home, it's factory set. And the job of that IFP is, it's like a compensator. So it puts pressure back on that oil to make sure it goes back through the rebound circuit uh, without any cavitation. And that's when uh, oil goes foamy with the air mixing with it, essentially. Now that is the common air shock, but you also get another variation, one that looks like that, that has a piggyback reservoir on there. Now, essentially on the inside, most things will be the same, except that IFP will be removed and it'll be in the reservoir. Now, the reason for doing this is an air shock is subject to getting hot. In use, it's gonna get hot with that friction of constant going up and down, and two things kind of happen. So with that air heating up, you get expansion on the inside and things move around, and the fluid itself gets hot. As the fluid gets hot, it can change viscosity, which means your damping characteristics change. So by moving the IFP externally, it's not affected by that, and also you get more oil. So again, it's less affected by the heat. Uh, so essentially, they look fairly similar, they operate fairly similar, but a piggyback shock will give you more performance if you're a more downhill bias rider. The downside, they're quite a lot heavier. Okay, and now with the coil shock. So the first thing that you can observe with the coil shock is you've got this whacking great coil spring on the outside. So unlike an air shock, which has to compromise by fitting the air spring and the damper in the same space, the benefit with having a coil shock is you've got only the damping on the inside and the spring on the outside. Now the springs themselves can be quite heavy. Now I'll take this off and I'll weigh it in a minute, but I'll just run you through the rest of the components on here first. So you've got the eyelets at the end, just like you do on an air shock, red rebound adjustment. This one actually has a control for a handlebar operated compression adjustment, but you would normally just see a dial here. You have the piggyback reservoir. And if you look on the actual shaft, you can see it's got a little rubber bumper. That's essentially the bottom out bumper because one of the traits that a coil shock has over an air shock is it has a linear action. Air, as you know, when you put it in a confined space and you compress it, it's gonna be progressive. Coil shocks are linear, so you do need a bottom out bumper there just to make them feel a bit better. 
Now this is a cutaway of, a, in fact, the same brand shock uh, as a cutaway. So you can see it with no spring on there. So on the inside, similar concept to the air shock, except there's no air area. Doesn't need to be there, of course. So this is all full of oil. This one has a piggyback. That is the IFP. So the same concept as the air shock. And this is your main piston with all your shims and ports on there. And there's also a negative spring, which is actually a coil spring in this case. It's not always the case on, on shocks. And the whole beauty of a coil shock is the lack of seals. Because it's only got oil on here, there's only one set of seals for that effective stanchion tube to pass through. That means it's very low friction, which corresponds with the very supple feeling that you can get from a coil shock. With an air shock, you have to override the main seal, you have to override the seals on the inside and that piston, both overcoming the air spring and then moving through the oil. So it's a very different concept. Now let's just take a spring off and this is something I want to show you. Okay, so I've just removed the core spring and you have a lower spring clip which holds it in place at the bottom of the shock and you have the preload ring at the top. Now one of the things with the coil shock is there's not really any adjustment with that spring. Now you can put a bit of preload on the shock but it doesn't change the spring rate. All that does is change the force required to get the shock moving initially and it's a very limited amount of movement. So if you have to put more than a few turns of preload on in order to get your sag correct, you're on the wrong weight spring. Now the spring itself, here's one of the things that you need to know. So this is a typical spring from Rock Shocks. If I'm just put this on the scales, this one weighs 517 grams. That is substantially more than the entire air shock. So this air shock weighs 385 grams. Okay, so you've already got over 500 grams plus the body of the shock at 455 grams. So you've got a shock that weighs well over a thousand grams in comparison to something that weighs under 400 grams. So that is one of the biggest differences with air shocks and coil shocks. Now, two more things to observe with coil springs are A, the spring rates that they come in and B, the materials and styles of spring you can get. Now, typically you'll get 50 pound increments between the actual weight of spring to suit your body weight, but you can get 25 pound increments as well. Now, one of the downsides with a coil shock is it's very difficult to get exactly uh, the percentage of sag that you require. If you want 30% sag, the chances of falling in between or getting absolutely nail on 25 pound or 50 pound increment in spring, uh, it's pretty lucky. It can be done, but it's not as accurate as setting a sag on an air shock, which technically between the minimum and maximum air pressure, it's infinite. So you can get it perfect every time. Now the springs, obviously they're very heavy, the standard springs. You can get a titanium spring. I mean, this one is much longer. This is from a downhill bike, but even then this one weighs 394 grams, so substantially lighter. So you think a smaller, more compact one, even lighter again, but they cost a lot of money. And one other fact with a coil shock is they have a linear action. You can get progressively wound springs, but it's not gonna dramatically change the shock. It basically just gives you a bit more ramp up towards the end, whereas an air shock will be more progressive by nature through its entire stroke. So one of the biggest initial questions is, can I actually fit one onto my bike? Well, the answer is kind of twofold here. So the first one is physically, if you can fit one on your bike, then there's no reason why you can't, but you have to bear a few things in mind. So coil shocks and air shocks are very different in size. Uh, obviously you'll be buying the shock that's the same length as your existing shock to fit on the bike, but the actual coil spring is quite big. And on some intricate rear suspension designs, you might physically not even be able to get one into the bike itself. So at this point, you might want to refer to the manufacturer of your bike to see if there's even clearance to get one in the frame. You also have to bear in mind, if your bike like this one doesn't have a piggyback shock on it, you might not be able to fit a coil shock that has a piggyback. So those are just some of the hardware based uh, reasons why you can't fit one to a bike. But if you can, technically you could fit it to any bike, but you might not necessarily want to do that because you've got to remember that coil shocks and air shocks achieve very different things, okay? So they're, well, they're both sprung shocks and they're both dampers, but air shocks are very progressive by nature because you're compressing air in a confined space. And because of that, you can be highly tunable. You can have a small air can and have it feel quite progressive, or you can have a big air can and it can feel a bit more linear. Plus you can tune that with volume spacers or volume bands. A coil shock is completely linear by nature. 
And yes, you can get a progressive spring, but it's not gonna change the whole stroke of the shock. It will basically be the end of the stroke just to help resist bottoming out that bit more. And there's lots of different bike designs. We're gonna go into this a bit later in the video. And there's probably the biggest reason why you can't fit a coil shock to a bike. But physically, yeah, you kind of could to most bikes. Reasons to get a coil shock. They are incredibly plush because you don't have to overcome all of the additional seals that you get inside an air shock. They're ultra sensitive, on, especially on choppy terrain. It just feels like they're working overtime thanks to that linear action of the shock. They're also more reliable and they last longer in between services. Uh, you're talking annually as a recommended from the manufacturers rather than probably every six months as, as you probably expect from something like an air shock. I mean, look at them. They're probably the coolest looking shocks available. Tell me that you've not looked at a coil shock and gone, yeah, I, I absolutely have to have one of those. Come on, we've all thought that, haven't we? Now, coil shocks are really good for tuning as well. Suspension tuners can get the most out of these and dial them into your riding and to the bike. And if you think you haven't got enough money to get a good coil shock, well, think again, because Marzocchi make the Bomber CR. It's just like the old Fox Vanilla RC, loaded with very simple features, but really easy to tune. Now, the last thing is, if you're worried about the weight with a coil shock, then you can get an SLS spring for them, a fraction of the weight of these bigger steel springs. And if you've got money falling out your pocket, well, you can just get a titanium spring, can't you? And the absolute last thing, if you still insist on wanting to get one of these bad boys and make the most of them, but it won't fit the bike or won't suit the bike, you could get a progressive spring. So the reasons against picking a coil shock, well, the linear nature that makes them so supple through that travel means they're not gonna play very well with some suspension configurations. Now, without going into detail about all frame designs, let's look at progressive leverage curves, linear leverage curves, and regressive. Now, if you've got a progressive curve, that's gonna mate really well with a linear shock. That's what you're looking for as a coil shock uh, user. If you were to put coil shock on a linear bike, you're gonna be sat in a travel too much. You're gonna ruin the dynamic ride geometry of that bike accordingly. And you're probably gonna use all that travel too often as well. And with a regressive design, well, you're just gonna go bottoming out the entire time. There won't be the support that you need for your shock, even with a progressive spring. Now, there are a few other things you need to know with a shock like this. Now, the first one, of course, is it's much heavier. Now, that might not put you off. Weight isn't everything. If you're out and out looking for the best ride qualities on the bike, a coil shock might give you what you want. And granted, you could spend a bit more and you can get an SLS spring or a titanium spring to, to get around that. And then, of course, there's the actual climbing attributes. Air shocks, when you lock them out, they feel amazing because you can actually prop the bike up with them. With the lockout or the climb switches you get on a coil shock like this, yes, it stops it bobbing up and down, but it's not going to keep it up in the travel. You'll actually find it might sit a bit lower, so your dynamic ride height won't be quite the same. I've noticed that on this, hitting my feet on some of the technical climbs. But hey, that might not bother you. Bothers me though. observations about riding the coil shock against the air shock um, on a bike I know really well really familiar with it is I've got to say initially I didn't think there was that much difference between the initial sensitivity because the back end of this bike is really supple it does work really well but what I did notice after just riding a little bit longer was the sort of the mid-sized bumps you know like uh, little rock steps not the sort of thing that's going to bottom out your suspension but that slight jarring effect on the coil shock it felt like uh, they were way smaller way smoother and that will be because of the linear nature of the shock but it never felt like I was using too much travel um, it's kind of it's a thing that I get you know you'll just get used to it's different to riding an air shock like actually no one is better they have very different attributes so if you're looking for something that literally sticks to the ground like they really do have that now part of that that I'm not sure I like but I think that you would get used to is I like to rely on the sort of uh, the really progressive nature of an air shock because I like to use that to maneuver the bike around and I'm sure some people that like jumping will know that sort of motion I'm trying to talk about with a coil shock of course you can do it and you would dial into doing it when riding one enough but when you're jumping between the two 
it's immediately noticeable, but that doesn't want to jump off the ground. It wants to stay on the ground. They're really, really effective at tracking the ground. And of course, that's what you want with something like that. Now, when I'm using the air shock on this bike, I don't actually use the climbing switch when I'm off-road as such. I'll use it on fire roads and things just so I can get the horsepower down a bit more. Uh, and today I'm not actually running the lockout on this shock, uh, just for ease of swapping the shocks back and forwards. So it's got no lockout as such. So I'm treating it the same as the air shock. And there's definitely a noticeability between the two. Now this, I think it is just because of that linear nature, even though the back end of this bike is progressive, it is, or it feels like it's sitting lower. It's not necessarily moving around more, but it feels like the pedals are closer to the ground. I'd have to measure this to be sure, but it just, I'm using my intuition here between the two, it feels lower on the bike. However, as soon as you point the thing down again, you kind of, you forget about it. I don't know, it's kind of cool. So somewhere where there is 100% loads more traction with the core shock over the air shock, is pedaling through the sort of the choppy stuff. Again, sort of um, this bike park wells is littered with these sort of slab type rocks. You're talking anything up to like a couple of inches tall. When you're trying to put a few cranks through them on an air shock, it's never really a problem until you ride the core shock against it. Again, this is because of the linear nature of the core shock. It's immensely sensitive for its entire stroke. You don't necessarily get that with an air shock. Now, the way that the air shock feels on this bike is it is supple to start with and it firms in the mid stroke and then it gets way more progressive towards the end, which is characteristically what I've always liked. It makes me realize when you pedal this through stuff, you've got loads more grit, the back wheel's staying on the ground and you're not skipping around. That's got to be worse, I mean. Well, I think that's probably just about covered whether or not you can and should fit a core shock to your trail bike. I mean, for sure, it won't climb quite as well as it would have with an air shock, but it's definitely got a different sense of fun on the descents again. And if that's important to you, then probably that's the way you want to go. Now, I'm sure you've got a bunch of questions about coil shocks, air shocks, and if you can fit one to your bike. Now, obviously, I couldn't list out every single bike you can and cannot. Uh, there's far too many out there, but get involved in the comments and let us know what you think. And uh, if you've got any ideas for what I should do in the next video, let us know. In the meantime, I'm going for another lap. See you later.